thank you guys. It's wonderful to be here. Can you hear me? Or would you prefer me in front of the mic? Wonderful. It's great, great acoustics. It's a great pleasure to be here. As I said yesterday at the event, I, I love going out, talking to people at your stage and trying to show you some of the amazing things you can do in a career in science and what, what some of the research that's opening up makes possible. Um, and I often feel guilty that you know, I should be doing my research, so I, I feel a little less guilty now. I've got a remit to do this. So, look, welcome. Um, this is my second time talking at the International Science School. I spoke at it in 2001 as a very fresh, um, new researcher myself. And I always love these, these fora. And what I said to a couple of you guys that were early in, um, I'd love to make this interactive. If you've got questions as I go along, Put up your hand, ask questions. It makes it much more interesting. And if you've got a question, it's probably the case that lots of your other friends also would like to know more. So what I'm going to tell you about today is really about light. And you've been hearing a bit about light. You've heard from what the wonderful Philip Russell, who's a real god in this field, about new ways of controlling light. I'm going to particularly tell you about some of the amazing new possibilities that come from being able to control light at the nanoscale and why we care about that. And really, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the concepts I'm going to introduce today. I'm going to talk to you about how you can introduce nanoscale structure to light. But can I just ask you, does anyone have any idea why the idea of putting nanoscale features into light, and we can talk more about what that is, why that might be challenging. Anyone got an idea? Quantum Sorry? Quantum oh, quantum effects certainly come into play and we start to, to sit at the edge of quantum physics. Has anyone got any other idea? Yeah, go for it. Wavelength. The wavelength of the light. So typical wavelengths of light are, roughly, throw me some you know. 400 nanometers, blue, correct. So I'm talking about light that has spatial structure in it down to the few tens of nanometers. So you need to be able to play some new games to be able to do that. And this is where the science of nanotechnology comes in and it's where new advances in material science allow us to control light down to that scale. One of the things that I'm most passionately interested in is taking light that we can generate and control in new ways and interacting it with matter. Essentially using light to tell us something about the world. Um, and what you'll see in this talk is I'm going to have a real mix of science, fundamental science, applied science, but also little bits of almost philosophy thrown in, okay? Because for me personally, one of the big, um, I guess, leap forwards in my own vision and understanding um, came a couple of years ago when I started to think about all the people doing experimental physics that I knew and all the varied problems they're studying, whether it's the furthest reaches of the universe or the subatomic structure of matter, or optics and lasers, what unites all experimental physics is the desire to push the limits of measurement, to make it more precise, or to measure something we couldn't previously measure. That's what physics, what unites physics. And really, um, what you're going to see today is how some new capabilities to control light gives us new physics that's both interesting in itself, because it teaches things we didn't know before, but allows us to create new measurement tools that allow you to ask different questions in other fields of science and to solve practical problems. And I'll make that real as we go through, if that's a bit abstract at the moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about advances in nanomaterials and nanoparticles, and I'm going to tell you how we can do a lot more if we don't just sit in physics as a silo, but we work very closely with chemists and biologists to develop some of these new materials. I'm going to take this all and give you some examples of how we can take these new measurement tools and create new approaches to sensing. And these approaches to sensing are as diverse as measuring something within an individual cell inside the human body, right through to measuring the mineral content within a few inch wide hole a kilometre below the Earth's crust. I'm also going to then really share with you this philosophy of what we call in IPAS a transdisciplinary approach to, measure, uh, to science, and I'll talk more about that. So there's some of the concepts I want to get through today. Now, I know you have um, 
Professor Ben Eggleton here from Sydney Uni talking to you on Friday, that's correct, and that you've had Philip Russell. I've tried to, talking to you, I've tried to minimise overlap, but there's a couple of key concepts I need you to understand to really make sense of my talk, so I'll go through them. But I'm going to start right at the beginning, because often when I get introduced, you know, my, my original job title was Professor of Photonics, and I get all sorts of really funny ones, Professor of Phototonics, or, you know, what, when you... Can I ask you, when you think of photonics, what does it mean to you? Can I just have an answer or two thrown out? What would you the study say? Of light. The study of light. Great. You're doing much better than most people I talk to. <laughs> Others? The study of light. That's right. So it's, it's a topic that you, you... You're right. So look, I'm going to start with this. It's the study of the photon, the fundamental particle of light, and each one of these pictures has a story to tell in terms of photonics. Whether it's the bundle of optical fibres that allow you to send information through them every time you do a Google search. Or whether it's the second image there, which is a little fingernail-sized laser used in telecommunications networks. Or the next one, and I know there's been quite a lot of research at the University of Sydney in this area. This is a creature called the sea mouse, and it lives around the coastal waters of Australia. And if you look at its spines around the outside, they glow iridescent colours. And those iridescent colours, if you look at them those little spines under the microscope come from micron scale patterns within the spines that make interesting ways of reflecting light. And Philip will have talked to you about that. And then on the far right, you might wonder why I'm showing a boat. That boat has a smart mast, which within it has optical fiber strain sensors that can tell the crew when the mast is experiencing too much strain and should be brought down. And I guess to give you a sense of the philosophy here, we could do, we can create a lot of smart materials. We can imagine starting to create smart buildings, smart structures, or, you know, I don't know how many of you guys have things like this. This rubber wristband on my arm um, is a Fitbit. Anyone heard of a Fitbit? It just, you can't feel you're wearing it, and you go about your daily activity, you can even wear it in the shower, and it tells you how active you've been that day. And like all scientists, I enjoy graphs, so I find it quite fun to see if I run up and down all the stairs how, how much difference that makes. So we're entering into a world where sensors can become ubiquitous and can change the way we live. And I'm going to tell you a journey of some new nanoscience that will underpin it, the next generation of sensors. But before I do that, I'm just going to introduce you to what I really see as the three waves of revolution in photonics. The two of them will be really familiar to you and the third will be much more familiar to you once we're finished talking today. Just over 50 years ago, the laser was invented. And at the time, it was seen to be a scientific curiosity and there was really no thought in the first early years to practical applications. It, I defy you, any of you, to go through a day without using a laser. You'd find it really, really hard. Whether it's your DVD player or buying something from the supermarket that's scanned at the checkout. Then, in the 80s, the um, next revolution came in being able to make silica glass transparent enough to send photons over hundreds of kilometres without needing to am be amplified. And that underpins our telecommunication systems. And it's, you can't argue that they have not changed our lives, those two revolutions. But I think we're right now at the cusp of a third revolution where we can use the photon to tell us everything from how, as I said before, a single cell responds to changes in its environment, to being allowed us to make better decisions um, in terms of healthcare and ex even mineral exploration. And some of the things I'm going to tell you about today really are examples, and all of these pictures is a story, is a talk in itself. What I'm going to do today is lead you through some of the concepts you need to understand what underpins all of these topics, which are all research areas and applications underpinned by new developments in photonics. But just go back to that original revolution. So that's a fantastic photograph. Um, I don't know if you've seen it before of Maiman uh, um, with the original laser. You can see it's a large benchtop system um, and they look very proud as they well should be. But now it's possible to weld cars together with lasers, with working distances of a metre plus. You, you can do all manner of things with lasers. 
The next revolution I told you about is communications. And you can see that optical fibres straddle the globe. And in fact, just last Friday at the opening, Chris mentioned we had Professor Sir David Payne, who was the lead inventor of something called the erbium doped fibre amplifier, the EDSA, um, in Adelaide, giving a talk at our launch. He, the, what the EDSA did was create a way of boosting the signal that we send down the optical fibre after a few hundred kilometres, so that it be, and doing that amplification, that boosting optically, meaning that these optical fibres can straddle continents and go across oceans. Now, the kind of fibres we use to go across oceans, you will have seen these, I'm pretty sure, at school. Who's, who knows the basic concepts for total and total reflection and how an optical fibre works? Yeah, everyone, fantastic. Okay, so these ordinary optical fibres, they can transmit light over a few hundred kilometres, um, incredibly transparent, and really is a great example of how material scientists developing the purest possible silica glass and optical physicists working out how to contain light within that core cladding structure could make a huge difference. But these structures, they're fantastic at transmitting light from one point to another. But the light stays within the glass. And one analogy I find is incredibly powerful um, that will lead you into some of the new concepts I describe is that these structures are like a pipe for light. Just like water travels through a pipe over a long distance, light travels within this glass, within the optical fibre, from point A to point B. I'm going to introduce you soon to some light guides that go beyond being pipes for light. But by manner of just um, broad introduction, first, you will have seen many images of the electromagnetic spectrum. And when we think of photons, we tend to think of the visible spectrum, that very narrow sliver of wavelengths between about four and 700 nanometers. When I talk about these concepts today in photonics, they're broad concepts that can be applied with appropriate scalings to everything from X-ray right through to the deep infrared. And many of the times the applications we talk about are not using visible photons, although it's, of course, what helps us to visualise the physics of what's going on. So the real concept I'm about to jump into is using new optical fibres to do a few things, to generate light. I know lasers are a fascinating topic and indeed optical fibres themselves can be incredibly efficient and effective lasers. I'll also touch on nano lasers, lasers that can be extremely small at the tip, say, of an optical fibre. Light itself can change the way light travels. And this is a fascinating area called nonlinear optics, which I'm not going to go deeply into today. Um, but for those of you who are interested, it, this inspires many researchers world round where you can put one colour of light into a special optical fibre and out the other end you can get a different colour or you can get the, the bandwidth of light in the sun. And you can use light to probe the nanoscale, which is where I'll put my focus today. So why do we care? So before I get into the what, I'll put it in the context of why we care. I've listed here all the reasons, all the applications, all the drivers for some of this research. And, you know, it's applications in medicine, in biology, in defence, in industry. Now, it might seem a little overwhelming, and I hope as I go through some of the examples it comes a little bit more to life, but this is wonderful because as a scientist... If you can do something that's not been done before and you can start to push the boundaries of knowledge and discover something new, and it can be useful, and you can work with people who need it, I can't imagine anything more satisfying. And that's, I guess, one of the key messages I'd like to give you today. But if you want to do any of this, we need new kinds of optical fibres. So I'm going to introduce you to three key concepts um, one of which probably is quite familiar to you from Philip's talk and perhaps the other two less so. So there are three key things that we can do to be able to do new things with optical fibres. And one of them is to be able to develop new materials to make them from. So silica glass, which we've talked about in, in terms of being able to transmit light with very, very low loss, over long distances, is fantastic if what you're looking to do is send light over long distances. But there are so many more things you can do if you had access to the right material. 
and I'll talk about that in a moment. And so within our own labs, we develop new kinds of glass, new materials that have new optical characteristics, and I'll give you a few exciting examples. The next thing, which I know Philip will have introduced to you, is the concept of putting structure inside the waveguide itself. These features, these holes, you're seeing here a cross-section of some of these patterns, and these holes can extend along the length of the optical fibre. And the features that we typically deal with can range from tens of microns down to tens of nanometers. So you can see it goes from scales bigger than the wavelength of light that we tend to deal with to much smaller. And if you think about it, it's quite sobering. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we do these so it seems you can, you can get your head around how it's done. And if any of you happen to visit Adelaide at any point, you can come in and see our labs about how, how you can make these fibres. Um, but essentially, if you think of a 20 nanometer hole over a few metres length of fibre and you calculate that aspect ratio, um, I believe it's actually the largest aspect ratio of any artificial structure that people have ever made. It dwarfs the Great Wall of China. So it's quite sobering to think that this technology allows us to do that. Then the third thing you can do, I think of it as the third leg of a stool here, the third thing you can do to offer access to new kinds of optical properties is do clever things at the interfaces. And here I'm not talking about the interfaces between the sciences, I'm being much more literal than that, I mean at the interfaces of the glass and the air within these structures. So you can put on smart chemistry, smart biology, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my lecture this afternoon, where we talk about new things we can do at surfaces. So what you can see is the three things we're bringing together is new optical physics, new concepts in optics, new concepts in material science and in nanoscience, and new chemistries. And when you bring all those things together, you can control and generate and photons in new ways, and you can interact those photons with things you want to measure. Happy to take any questions, but I'm going to get in more detail soon. So before I do that, I just want to share with you a little bit of philosophy in a way. And it's about this concept of transdisciplinary science. Now, can I just ask, have you guys heard that term before? Yes. Okay. Now, typically in, um, in this field, there's a looseness to with which people use that terminology. And I'm going to talk with you through my own choices in the language so you can make your own informed choices. But essentially, if you have scientists with very different backgrounds and skill sets and you form teams, it allows you to develop disruptive technologies. And what a disruptive technology is, is not an improvement over the way we currently solve a problem. It is a totally new, game-changing way of solving a problem. And that then creates new approaches and new tools that people can use to do different science. And so you can see this is a cycle. Once you can do different science, then you have more science to put into the mix to de develop disruptive technologies. That may seem abstract. Perhaps we'll come back to it at the end and see if it makes more sense when I've talked to you through here. I guess what I'm talking about is perhaps challenging you um, to think about what, what science is and how it translates to our everyday world. Because... There's a traditional view that you know, scientists go away, lock themselves up in the lab, become deep experts in, in a discipline, and then some fragment of their scientific knowledge they generate trickles through the valley of death and becomes technology. And that's true to a degree, and you definitely need deep subject matter experts, otherwise we, we don't advance. But I've discovered, just from living and breathing it over the last decade, that if you work with people who have a problem, you work with industry, you work with healthcare professionals, you work with people who really need to be able to do something they can't do, and you just stay childlike in terms of asking, but why do you do that? But how does that work? And you just keep asking the questions. What that does is it drives really fundamental science as well as solving problems. So it's turning it on its head. So just briefly to go through that concept, these are all the terms you've probably heard thrown about, sometimes utterly interchangeably, and until about five years ago, that's what I was doing, and I just wanted to quickly introduce you to what this means. Okay, so this may be obvious, but disciplinary science is when you say, okay, I love, say, in my case, physics. Yeah? I want to become a physicist, and I decided that at about age 14. Previous to that, I was going to be a concert cellist, and I still play the cello in the local symphony. But... Um, 
I guess what I discovered is just the beauty, and I guess you guys have all discovered science too. You wouldn't be here. You're our best and brightest young potential scientists here in the audience, and that's wonderful. It's just it's such a joy to be here. But, you know, what, we all pick an area because we have a love for some type of science. That's disciplinary science, and it's a wonderful thing. And one of the things that comes, though, from that is when we work in a disciplinary area, we have a hammer, which is our set of tools in that discipline. So every problem looks like a nail. Okay? So what do we do to get a step beyond that? Well, cross-disciplinary science is about when we have different disciplines, might be, say, physics and material science, and we might have a set of tools that come, say, from physics, and we apply them to problems in material science, say? And that's led to extraordinary breakthroughs. And one of them that I put up here because of the historic link to the name of the building that I've just opened on Friday, the Braggs, was the Nobel Prize winning father-son team, William and Lawrence Bragg. They discovered that by looking at beautiful patterns that happen when people shine x-rays through, crystal, through crystals, that they could use these beautiful patterns to understand the structure of the atoms in those crystals. And that now has led to this field of protein crystallography, which people can use to understand the most extraordinarily beautiful and complex structures of proteins. And this is critical in modern medical research. This is cross-disciplinary research. What is multidisciplinary research? Well, the little cartoon there shows the, stereo the caricature. It's where you have a problem where you need views and expertise from a panel of experts that contribute their views to the problem. Interdisciplinary research is where you set a goal that could not be achieved without developing some integrated knowledge across an interface of disciplines. And I think the best example is the optical fibre itself. It required the concepts in how you guide light married with advances in purification of materials. And finally, transdisciplinary research is where the problem itself could not even be defined without people from different areas. And what this is all about, and I apologise for those who are desperate to get into the hardcore physics, but you're about two minutes away. Um, the, the problem in this space is language. And I'm not talking about English versus Chinese and other tongues, but I'm talking about language of science. Even in subtly different areas of science, you find that fields develop their own way of speaking, their own language, their own... everything from the obvious, like acronyms, to the less obvious, like what they value as a contribution to science. And it's those languages that often impede people working together. Okay. So what this transdisciplinary approach allows you to do is to develop new tools to answer questions that otherwise could not have been asked. I'm now going to tell you a little bit about new optical materials and how we can introduce nanoscale properties and structures. And again, this is for you guys. If you have a question, stick a hand up, ask a question, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm going to start with the simple, glass. What you can see here is three types of glass that you'll see in our labs every day that we work with. They all look quite different. The examples of glasses I'm showing you here are about the size of paperweights, a few hundred grams in weight. The bottom left example is something called a lead silicate glass. It's probably more similar to like a lead crystal whiskey glass than anything else that you might have seen. It's a heavy glass. Um, this one here is a bismuth oxide glass. It's got bismuth in it. And this is a chalcogenide glass, and I know a lot of researchers here at the University of Sydney do a lot of work with chalcogenide glass. Now, this doesn't look like a glass. It looks like a metal, because no visible line can get through it. So I've given you a clue as to why we're interested in some of these different glasses, and it's shown in this graph here, which shows you, as a function of the wavelength of the light, the attenuation or the loss of the, these different glasses, of many different families of glasses, so you can see this thin black line here is silica glass, the glass we're all most familiar with, the telecommunication fiberglass. It starts to become opaque as you get into longer than visible wavelengths. So if you wish to transport 
wavelengths, say in the mid infrared, say from three to five microns, which you need to do for applications in defence, you need to do for applications in medicine and surgery, it's no good. You need to work with other glasses such as these chalcogenides that are transparent in that range. And this is really a matter of, at this present state of the art, precision chemistry, almost a type of precision cooking. And um, I'll show you a little bit later the facilities we use to do this. So the first thing I'd like to show you is a new um, class of laser that's recently been developed in our labs because it's the simplest device that I can explain to you that takes the power of these new glasses and turns it into something that I really honestly believe is a disruptive technology. So what you can see up here is a little slab. You can see the scale, that's a $1 coin, of a glass called Z-Blan. It's a fluoride glass and it transmits light up to about six microns in wavelength. Into this glass, we've discovered in collaboration with colleagues here in Sydney at Macquarie University that if we expose this glass, if we hit it with femtosecond pulses of light, very short bursts of very intense light, we can change the density of the glass. And that, can anyone tell me what optical characteristics density is related to? Fantastic. So you're changing the refractive index of the glass. And this was known that if you put this intense light on a glass, you can change the arrangement of the atoms. You're essentially heating it up and you're changing the arrangement of atoms. And you can change its index. Now, in most of the work done before we started playing with this, and I use that very deliberately because that's often what we're doing, um, the density of atoms would increase and so the refractive index would increase. What we discovered when we did this is the opposite in this particular glass. The density of atoms would decrease, so the index decreased. Now, if you take a uniform piece of glass and expose it along, say, a line within the material to this femtosecond irradiation, and thus you decrease its index, what would you expect to happen to light that you send into the, way, into the chunk of glass? Anyone got an idea? It doesn't matter if it's wrong. You would if it was an increase in index. You would if it was an increase in index, and that's what everyone was doing at the time. Spot on. And, and thank you for having that courage, because you having that courage to do it will encourage your, your friends to do it as well. Okay, but if it's decreasing the index, that'll just increase the diffraction of the light going in. It's like an anti-guide. That's not a lot of use. So what we did was we discovered that if we made a series of these lines through the glasses and we overlapped them in like an annulus, we could create a region in the centre that was unexposed and thus had a relatively higher refractive index than the surrounding area and thus we could guide light through this central unexposed region of glass. And this is what's been done within these little chips of glass to make a new kind of laser because what we do is we can dope this glass, we can introduce rare earth atoms, things like thulium, praseodymium, holmium, Ytterbium, erbium, just look at that chunk of the periodic table. And that means that you can take this little chip of glass and just stick a little diode laser from your DVD player at the end of it. That light goes into this little wave guiding region in the centre which didn't have any femtosecond exposure. And because of those rare earth ions in there, you generate another wavelength of light. And this new form of laser, which we're calling a chip laser, has optical characteristics that actually rival and exceed other lasers that are currently used in industrial applications that take up about the size of this lectern. And yet it's something that's about the size of your little finger now. Now I show you this because it's an incredibly simple concept. It's just a new material, whack it with some femtosecond light and package it up. But it shows you the power in this field to combine together the ability to make something and try it out and harness the serendipitous discovery to do something new. And so we're at Adelaide trying to spin this off into a company at the moment, which I hope will provide jobs for some of our graduates coming through and help in its small way with um, lifting some of our opportunities in Australia for manufacturing, which, if you read the papers, is pretty gloomy in that sector at the moment. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit more complex in my physics. And I'm going to be quite brief, because I know Philip covered this. One of the things I'm really excited by is introducing structure to the material. 
in many, many ways, and you'll see that by the end of today. The first type of structure I'm showing you here is a case where you introduce air holes across the section of the fibre. Now, as Philip would have told you, the reason researchers started doing that was because we thought, let's copy what nature does. Let's copy this understanding that if we have a periodic pattern in a material, and in fact I'll go to this, this slide first, if we have some sort of a periodically patterned material, and if you consider how light reflects and refracts, reflects and reflects at, refracts at each of those interfaces, you can get certain conditions where all of the transmitted light cancels out and you only have reflected light. And those special conditions are called a photonic band gap. And essentially, by putting pattern in material, you can make perfect mirrors for certain colours of light. And that's what's happening in these various creatures that have these wonderful iridescent colours. Let's try to copy that in the form of an optical fibre. So researchers, including myself, started putting these patterns in optical fibres. But we discovered, again, it's this message of kind of try things and see what happens. And sometimes it's what you expect, sometimes it isn't. And when it isn't, sometimes you learn something quite new. What we discovered was really a new way of doing total internal reflection. Because if you miss one of the holes out in the centre, this region has a relatively higher refractive index. It's surrounded by a holy region with, a, on average, lower refractive index. And you can guide light in the solid region in the centre. Can everyone see this is just a variant of total internal reflection, just looks a lot more complicated? At the time I started working in this field, I, I was just out of my PhD, and they were called, as Philip would have called them, photonic crystal fibres. Um, and I found that even at conferences you go to, people were dreadfully confused about how they worked because they'd been reading up on these photonic crystal effects and they're quite complex to understand and predict and model. Um, I started calling them holy fibres to try and distinguish so people didn't get bound up on these photonic crystal effects because essentially that's what it is. It's an effective refractive index around in this cladding region that is somewhere between that of air and glass. And exactly where that effective refractive index sits depends on how much air there is and the scale of the features relative to the wavelength of the light. But probably one of the most practical impacts that has come out of this technology and I'll tell you the way we make them, which is quite special in a moment, is a very, very, very simple one. What Does anybody uh, maybe hazard a guess? I'll see if anyone can come up with this. When you make a fibre this way, can you think of any advantage doing it this way as opposed to having the traditional concept of a core and a cladding? Go, no, you've had a go, so maybe I'll go for this guy. That's fantastic. You don't have to cover the core with something else. So another way of saying that is you can do it in one material. Now what you might not realise is that more than 99% of the possible optical materials that you could use to make an optical fibre can't be used because there are material science challenges in terms of compatibility of core and cladding materials. When they meet at that interface, that interface between the core and cladding has to be perfect. It has to be smooth. Okay? And also, if they have any chemical interactions with them in them, if they have any scattering, then that ruins the performance of the optical fibre. And it's essentially dealing with that interface and fabricating the silica fibres in a very well-developed way that enables those fibres to be low loss. But most other materials that might have characteristics you want to exploit, you can't use because you need to find two materials that are friendly. So that's something I wanted to point out. So this concept, the original concept of putting holes in in order to make these band gaps, i show you here an example, and you would have seen some the other day, of one we've made in our lab where we've made a two-dimensional photonic crystal that's wrapped around an air hole. And you can see that that allows us to guide light in air because that particular range of wavelengths, and you can actually see a sort of bluey, purplish tinge to that light, that reflects the wavelengths which are not allowed to travel in the periodic structure. Now, our ability to structure materials at sub-wavelength scales is not limited to glass and air. 
It's a nice model system. And I'm just going to give you the tiniest taste of something that I know Ben Eggleton's going to talk a bit more about on Friday. And that's metamaterials. Has anyone heard of a metamaterial? Oh, cool. I get to introduce you to metamaterials. Okay. Well, one of you. So, they're kind of exciting, current, modern, and not. Because I show you the Lycurgus cup. And in its way, it is a medical, me, uh, sorry, metamaterial. This is the same piece, viewed under two different light conditions. Depending on whether you view it in reflected light or transmitted light, it looks entirely different. And the reason is, is because the glass that it's made of has nano-sized gold particles in it. And those nano-sized gold particles suspended in the glass have very special properties and we now have the tools to understand them and this is the field called metamaterials. These are some of the first de metamaterial devices, sorry, my laser point is dying, metamaterial devices ever fabricated for use at microwave wavelengths because often in optics if we want to play a game with structure, we start with really long wavelengths such as those in the microwave. Can anyone think of why? Why it's often easier for us to try out new ideas at long wavelengths? Go for it. Bigger. It's that simple. They're bigger. It's hard. It's really hard to pattern things down at a few nanometer scales or even at a few micron scales. If we can do it at millimeters and centimeter scales, we can try out the ideas without having to advance the technologies for fabrication. But some of the things you can do with these metamaterials, and I don't want to spoil Ben's thunder too much, so I'm introducing them so you're primed for him on Friday, is very Harry Potter-like here, but cloaking. The idea that you can make a material that has optical characteristics that bend light rays around it so you cannot see it. It's not camouflaged. It simply does not look like it is there because you have essentially, just like you can think of bending space-time in general relativity, you can bend light around an object. Or, as shown here, you can have essentially a negative refractive index. So you see the concept where, you know, you expect light normally in a denser material to bend towards the normal. It goes the other way around if you have a negative refractive index. What does that mean? Well, the implications are really fascinating and I'm not going to have time to tell you more now, I'm afraid. But you could always read up about it if you want. There's lots of good resources on the web about metamaterials. Okay, so now, from the very current to the rather glorious historic plaque, Maxwell's equations. Now, I put this up here to ground us. Has everyone seen Maxwell's equations before? Okay, now, I know that the maths involved with them is something that you won't really get your teeth into till you get to university. But in many ways, what you're already learning at school are all embedded within Maxwell's equations. Whenever you learn about light, anything to do with magnetism, electricity, it's all buried in there. And the reason I put it up there is to say that in this field that I'm describing to you today, the physics is all in here. Okay? The physics is all buried in here. Even when we're starting to talk about some of the new nanoscale features and what we can do with light at the nanoscale, it's all in there. So you might think, well, what is there to do? Well, often we, it's hard to push forward new physics simply by taking this set of equations and throwing it on a computer and solving it numerically. You can do that. You know, you can write a computer program or download one that solves Maxwell's equations and you can put in a particular material, you tell it what light you shine on that material and it can tell you what light comes out of that material. But if you want to be able to understand the physics, and drive forward new ideas, you need to go a little bit deeper. So I put that there, there as a framework for what's to come. But now what I'm going to do is take you on a one-slide tour of a chunk of our labs to give you a sense of how this is done because I don't like just showing you these images without giving you a sense of what it would be like to actually do this. Because all this work I show you today, in the research that's coming in the rest of this lecture and the one this afternoon, is done by researchers ranging from summer students that come after first or second year uni right through to PhD students and staff researchers. Here is an example of one of the facilities we use to make these new glasses. What it is is very simple. It's what we call a glove box. It looks very friendly. It has its arms stretched out when you go in the lab. 
It's got a dry, clean nitrogen atmosphere inside it. We keep it as dry and pure as we can so that nothing external contaminates the glass. We buy white powders that are very pure of certain chemicals that we need as the ingredients for our glass. They have what we call four or five nines purity, meaning 99.999% pure specified chemical required. We then batch them, which just means precision cooking, mix them together in very precise recipes, which we develop new recipes for new glasses. In a crucible, which is essentially a coffee cup-sized piece of metal, it might be solid pure platinum, solid gold, platinum gold. It depends on the chemistry of what you're doing. You want to make sure that when you mix these powders in that crucible and heat it up until they become a molten glass, that there's no reaction between that metal holder and the contents within. So what we do is we take it up and feed it into a furnace which has a very precisely controlled temperature gradient until it's a molten glass. And that could happen for some glasses at 200 degrees. It can happen for some glasses at 12, 1300 degrees. That's the kind of range we're playing with. You then bring it down, this cup, coffee cup sized vessel with molten glass in it and you pour it into a mould and you then lower it into what we call an annealing furnace where we very slowly cool it down because if you cool it down too fast, it builds stresses into the glass and it can crack. And what comes out is a piece of glass, as I said, paperweight sized. Then we take it to the next stage of our process and this is probably one of the coolest things to play with as a new student in the lab. This is where we do glass extrusion. We take that paperweight sized glass and we heat it up till it just starts to soften and we squeeze it under a set force of a ram coming down, pushing it up from the top, and within a well-defined temperature, and we squeeze, just like kids playing with Play-Doh, <laughs> we squeeze pattern into that glass. And these patterns are millimetre scale features. Okay? Typically one to a few millimetres. And that can happen, you make you a piece of glass that's say a metre long with those millimetre scale features within it. And this gives you enormous freedom to play, to try out new designs, to, to, to try out new ideas. But you just don't try at random. You do a whole suite of electromagnetic modelling to figure out what pattern of hole should give what optical characteristic you're trying to get. Once you've made that pattern, the next stage in the process is to reduce its scale those millimetre scale features are no use to us unless you're working with microwaves. And so we do that on something called a fibre drawing tower. In the fibre drawing tower, we feed this large scale piece of glass. It's outer diameter, might be one or two centimetres. It's quite big. And we feed it into a radio frequency furnace and it starts to fall under its own weight at the bottom. So imagine we've got this rod of glass and at the bottom we heat it until its weight pulls it down and it starts to neck. We attach that glass coming out of the furnace to a rotating drum and by controlling the temperature, the speed at which we feed it into the furnace, the speed at which we pull it out, the gas flow, the gas temperature, the pressure or vacuum inside the structure, you can make features that go down to 10 or 20 nanometers in size to an accuracy of greater than 1%. So this is truly a wonderful technology and unlike much na nanotechnology you find in universities, you can make it at large scale because it is a stretching drawing process. So there's a joke in optical fibre research, you want a new fibre? Yeah, no problem, the first metre costs you a million, the rest is free because you are always making it scale. Once you've made your structure, that might be enough depending on what you're trying to do. But what we're often interested in doing is putting new function onto that surface to create a new device. And I'll talk more about that this afternoon. <clears throat> so, I just show you here a zoo of things that we're doing in our labs. Each one of these is a talk. And I'm not going to give you all of them, just a couple of highlights. You can see everything from, in this case, a 20 nanometer hole, to this case, I showed you an air guiding fibre, to this case, a fibre designed to measure corrosion within an aircraft from a distance without pulling it apart. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about something else you can do to change, to introduce nanoscale structure. I'll come back to some of these examples when I get into some of the applications work a bit later, but you can see, and in fact I should have said this, can you see that tiny little dot in the centre there? I'm going to come back to that. It's actually a tiny little triangle of glass, which can be as small as two or 300 nanometers across. That is the core of this optical fibre. And that is no longer a pipe for light. It's more of a rail for light. And just like a tram can be guided by a rail but not contained within it, light can be guided by that rail but not contained within it. Meaning that the light spreads into these air voids and can be used to make a measurement of a liquid or a gas. And I'll come back to that later. But what I'd like to do now is introduce you to another concept for introducing nanoscale structure. Because if you have nanoscale structure in your material, you can start to control light on the nanoscale. And I'm going to come back to this concept of putting nanoparticles in glass in this Lycurgus cup, which I've told you about. And here's another example of what's called gold ruby glass, which gets its red coloration not because of an absorption of the material, but because of metal nanoparticles within the glass. And the real explanation for how this worked first came um, and, uh, from here from a guy called Zygmunt and he won the 1925 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work. So I'd like to show you now how what we're doing is taking this a little, bit step, a little step further. So imagine now we've got one of these pieces of glass that we've made in our labs and I'm just telling you it's a uniform, homogeneous glass with no nanoscale structure in it. But imagine that when we make it, we make sure there are gold ions within it, uniformly distributed within that glass. If we now expose it to certain conditions that enable those gold ions to seed and grow and nucleate and turn into gold nanoparticles, you change its characteristics and it gets that distinctive red colour. However, that's a bit limited. And that's a little bit limited because... You, you have to work, you have to expose it to certain very well defined temperature ranges, and you're limited to ions such as gold that you can suspend in the glass. So, a new approach that we've been taking is saying, hey, imagine we've got a nanoparticle that we really want to use. And I'm going to give you an example in a moment with okay. nano diamond, so wait for that. So, we've got some kind of nanoparticle that has some particular light emission property or some really exciting nanoscale property we want to use. How can we get it in our glass? Well, one way we can do it is that when we have the molten glass, and here's some molten glass inside a crucible made of platinum, we can just dope in, we can directly add those nanoparticles to the molten glass. And when we do that, we create a glass, and in this case, you're seeing a glass, the first glass ever doped with nano diamond. And again, a funny little story there. We tend to think of diamond as very precious, very valuable. In this particular clay, case, adding this dust of nano diamond to the glass, it's actually the least expensive component. So you could argue it reduces the value or the cost of the glass, which I just think is a cool little factoid. So why would we want to do that? And we want to do that because diamond, particularly nanoscale diamond, can have some really intriguing properties, one of which I'd like to share with you. Little, these little specks of diamond, which are about 40 nanometers across, can have something called a nitrogen vacancy within their structure. And this nitrogen vacancy can have a characteristic where it can emit just one photon at a time. It's called single photon emission. Now, you may not have thought about this, but almost all sources of light we can think of, whether it's a laser or any other form of light, we tend to get fo photons by the bucket load. However, there are some applications and some areas of physics where we'd love to be able to just get a single photon on demand. And some really, can anyone think of an example where knowing you only have one photon would make a difference? Go for it. Perfect. Quantum, I heard quantum communication, quantum cryptography, absolutely spot on. <coughs> right. Did you say that? Or I heard someone say that? Quantum computing, absolutely spot on. Okay. So 
Look, and this is a vibrant field internationally, and we're very good at it in Australia, with really good groups here in Sydney and elsewhere, and in Melbourne. Um, however, at the moment, these nanoscale devices, or nano um, diamond for, is one beautiful material for this. If you have a speck of diamond 40 nanometers across, you need an enormously expensive and complex confocal microscope to be able to know where it is, <laughs> you need to be able to interrogate it, and to be able to excite it and measure its emission. And that's fine if you're doing research in a research lab, but it does rather limit what you can do in applying it in the real world. So what we've done in collaboration with researchers in Melbourne is take this nano diamond and put it in as a dopant to the glass itself. And by doing this, we're able to take something that is really human scale, like a hair thickness optical fibre that you can touch and feel and make in large length, and give it a nanoscale property. In this case, this is a measurement taken from nanodiamond within our glass. So maybe if I just talk you through how this would work. You take a strand of this diamond doped glass. You send light into one end of the fibre, just like you do with a fibre you use for communications. That light excites the nanodiamond, which then has the statistical property of giving off single photons. So now you no longer need to have that speck of nanodiamond within your microscope. You can start to use it in devices outside. And this will be a theme as I go into this afternoon's talk because often what we're trying to do is push the limits of measurement, but not just in the ideal, perfect environment of the laboratory but in real situations where we want to use them. So why do we care? Well, I've told you a little bit about single photon sources. You yourself said, yeah, question, go for it. Lovely. Look, it's a very good question, and in fact, I'm about to come back to that topic in a sec in a different context, so thank you um, for positioning everyone's thoughts. Uh, in this case, we get a lower energy or longer wavelength photon out of the diamond than we pump in. Okay, so that is not an up conversion process. I'm about to teach you about up conversion. <laughs> um, but it, no, so it, that's not the case. But essentially, you do put many photons into the fibre, but you selectively couple essentially, from the fibre to the nanoparticle. Um, and so you can then controllably get single photon statistics out of that, out of that centre. Um, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more in the break. I'm conscious that a proper explanation would take me probably 10 or 15 minutes, so I don't want to distract the lecture too much at this point. But I guess that the, the concept I was hoping to get lodged in your mind, and I think it is from your question, is this interfacing between something that's microscale, which is your fibre, which we can deal with every day, and something that's nanoscale, which we traditionally need to put into a microscope. That interface can be done by putting the nanoscale feature inside the microscale object, which is the fibre. And the coupling, which I talk about, is that a word that you guys have come across before, the coupling? Because it has a, as a, both an intuitive and a very technical meaning. Um, what it means is essentially if we put in photons, photons within the waveguide that are guided by the fibre, you can calculate very easily the efficiency with which that light can then turn into an excited state of that nanodiamond so that nanodiamond can emit. So essentially you're converting that one form of energy which is in the waveguide to the energy coming out of the diamond. And you don't do that with great high efficiency. So your question about many photons going in, many of them don't make it to where you want them, but enough of them do that you can get the single photons. Yeah, so they're an absolute plague and scourge. They form your background signal, and you've got to play all sorts of really clever games to get rid of them. And one of the clever games you play is something called time gating. So we know something about the temporal characteristics of the emission from nanodiamond, and we know it's different from the temporal characteristics of light in the glass, and that's where you can use clever electronics to essentially gate or filter out temporally signals that are not from diamond. Fantastic question. Okay, some of the reasons we want to do this. Um, you can do nonlinear optics with it. You can use light to control light. 
You could conceive of making solar cells with enhanced efficiency. And super bright light sources. Somebody earlier looked excited at the idea of nanoscale lasers. This is one example of a little bead of glass at the tip of a fibre which is in itself a laser. And in this case, the gain medium or the thing that causes the energy to increase is the diamond emission itself. One thing I'm really excited about is the fact that the emission from diamond changes in the presence of a magnetic field. It can be a magnetometer. Now, if you imagine that the little device in which you put your diamond is small enough that it's smaller than the scale of a single cell in the body, and imagine you now place that speck of diamond, say, within a little fibre or the tip of an optical fibre right next to or within the cell, you can then, by looking at changes in the emission from that diamond, you can tell what ions are travelling in and out of the cell. Again, I hope this now is the first glimpse of how you could then do a different thing, ask a different question, say in biology, that you couldn't do without this measurement tool. So what I'm going to do now is take you into the world of optical nanorails. And this will all together, come together before the end of this lecture with nanoparticles. And I'm going to talk you through this concept that I mentioned about optical fibres being rails for light. Some of us work well with words, some work well with pictures, so I've got a picture for those who enjoy that. This is a conceptualisation of a standard optical fibre, the yellow being the outside of the fibre, and the red being the light guided within it. It is very much contained within it. However, if we now play the game, the thought experiment of making that fibre smaller and smaller, the light has no choice but to start to extend beyond it. And these are nanorails, optical rails, rails for light, but that light, that red splodge is still guided by that fibre. You can bend it, you can tighten a knot, and it still travels along the fibre. And here are two examples of ways researchers in the field do this. They can take an ordinary optical fibre and heat it and stretch it and taper it down until it becomes comparable to or smaller than the wavelength of light and the light starts to come outside. You can make something that in itself is a nanowire. And this is a great example of one turned into a little knot, which itself becomes something called a resonator, which I'm going to get back to in this afternoon's lecture. These are, work really well. But the problem is, is these little nanorails, once you've made them, are so ephemeral that you lose them more times than you use them. Okay? In the lab. The challenge with tapers is that you can only make them a certain length because they're very fragile. So the particular approach that we've taken that we've found to be surprisingly, unexpectedly useful is this. This is something we call a suspended core optical fibre. The outside of it is the same diameter as a standard optical fibre, again, hair thickness, 125 microns generally. In the centre, you've got this little nanorail the optical rail, which acts exactly like this illustration here. All the, depending on its size, it could be either have all of the light inside it or most of the light outside it, just depending on the size of that core relative to the wavelength of light it guides. And it's held up within this bigger structure by these three long, fine strands of glass and thus has these three black air voids, which very conveniently serve as sample chambers. So as I'll show you, if you take this fibre and you dip it into a liquid, capillary action sucks up your liquid into your fibre and all of this lovely light that's outside of the glass is then interacting with that liquid. And this is what the light then looks like. So this is the result of some electromagnetic modelling of this structure. You can see conceptually it's the same as this thought experiment I showed you. You can see these strands of glass here. What you see interestingly is that light is confined in high-intensity layers on that surface. See these layers of bright, high-intensity light? They can be 20, 30 nanometers thick. So even though the fibre itself is, say, in this instant, I think it's six or 700 nanometers, we're now getting structure within here that has a feature size much smaller than that. Okay, so I've given you a glimpse of how this works, and this is one of my students dipping one of these fibres into a cuvette, a vial of liquid, which then goes up into the fibre. I'm going to just quickly talk you through the very simplest thing you can do with this. 
So imagine you dip this into a liquid and the liquid starts to fill up into the holes. You can use this then as what we call a dip sensor. So imagine now from the other end of this fibre we send in light and imagine for the purpose of this it's green light. It often is green light. Okay? Because that green light interacts with the material in the holes, it can trigger some response in that material. It could either be you could look for some absorption characteristic in the material or you could look for some fluorescent response of the material or many other things. So let's imagine now that there are some kind of fluorophores out in that material in the liquid in the holes. Those fluorophores cause light to be emitted in all directions, but you happen to have right here something called a very high numerical aperture waveguide. Essentially, you have something that's really good at catching light. So a good proportion of that light that's generated in the holes can be collected by the fibre. And approximately half of it goes in the forward direction where it's not a lot of use because it just makes the picture look pretty. And in the backwards direction travels back along towards the direction you sent the light in in the first place. And you can predict this, how well this works, and you can design these fibres to be very efficient sensors. And if you have a look here, this graph shows you some predictions of what happens as you make the size of the fibre core smaller and smaller, more and more of the light comes out till when you're at about two or 300 nanometres, you've got more than half of the light located in those voids. Okay, so we use this concept to do many... Yeah, question, sorry I didn't spot you. It's a very good question, very good question. We include that in the modelling to try and understand how it works. So does anyone know the refractive index of water? 1.33? 1 1 yeah, roughly. So um, it depends on the situation, but roughly 1.33. So um, all biological samples are around about aqueous refractive index, slightly higher for proteins. It's silica glass, anyone happen to know its index? 1.45. It it's a significant enough index change from air to 1.33 that the way the light is guided is changed significantly. And so you need to put that into your model to understand what's going to happen. But you can also play the game of making your glass out of higher refractive indices, which I didn't talk about today, but some of the glasses we work with have indices up to two and a half. So that's another lever you can play with. But good question. But you, you certainly have to predict it, but it doesn't cause you a problem because almost all the liquids that you could consider using have refractive indices low enough to mean you still have total internal reflection. Okay, so each one of these pictures is a different concept. On the left side are some of these dip sensors, which I'm going to talk to you about, and on the right side are a whole lot of resonant architectures. And the one thing that you... And I'm going to talk about resonance this afternoon. Can I just ask, have you guys all come across resonance yet? Yes? Okay. No. So a mixture. That's fine. I'm going to talk you through it. Essentially, the thing, the physics that unites every image on this slide is enhancing the interaction of light with matter. Maybe if we take a step back, imagine you've got a material. Maybe it's a liquid in a vial you want to interrogate. The simple, what's the simplest thing you could do to interact that with light if you had a laser? What could you do? Shine it on it, that's what I heard, yeah? Absolutely. And can anyone think what's going to limit that interaction? What's the key physics that limits the interaction of the laser you've shone on the vial of liquid? Diffraction, spot on. Now, you could always try to get around that a bit by, turning, by using higher light intensities. Can anyone think of how to, for the given laser you've got, I'm not saying you can go out and buy a high power laser. You've got your laser you've got. What's a game you can play to create a higher light intensity? Focus it more. Okay, and what happens to the diffraction when you focus it more? Increases. So it's a losing game here, yeah? Use a high intensity, you get greater interaction, but it diffracts quicker. And those two things cancel each other out. So if we want to enhance the interaction of light with matter, we've got to be a bit cleverer than that. And there's two main ways we can do it. One way is by guiding our light. And that's what I've been talking to you about today. Putting our light in a fibre so it's guided along this rail so it doesn't diffract. Another way, which is conceptually a little more complex but 
much more interesting from a physics point of view is resonance. Resonators are architectures and geometries that rattle a light around in a cavity so that you essentially get the same idea of integration of signal because that light is rattling around and interacting with the same material over and over and over again. So all of the structures on the right hand side are resonators that I'll talk to you about into this afternoon's lecture. So what I'm going to do is start with these simplest concepts which I believe I've introduced well enough now that you can start to understand how they work and talk to you about how they can sense. The first class is the suspended core fibres and the idea that the light is out here and the sample loads into those chambers is incredibly simple but surprisingly profound. Now, one of the most useful things about this is that we typically, even if we load, say, five centimetres of the fibre, which is a huge distance, yeah, when you're talking nanoscale stuff, if you load five centimetres of the fibre with the liquid, you're dealing with about two nanolitres of liquid because the holes are small. There are a few microns across. Now, I'll tell you a funny story, which um, I hope helps show you why I love doing what I do. Back about six years ago, um, I was working with some colleagues at DSTO, Defence Science and Technology Organisation, and they said, look, we've got this really practical challenge, can you help us? We have fuel on our aircraft that is used both as fuel and as a coolant. And over time, it degrades. Nasty biological things grow in it, and it becomes not safe as a fuel. And we don't have a good test, a good dipstick for the quality of that fuel. So what could be done? And so we asked the question, well, what is it that is an indicator in the fuel that we could measure that might be able to tell us it's going off? And they said, well, an early indicator is something called hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, a very simple molecule. If you could develop a probe for hydrogen peroxide, we could have a pathway to develop a dipstick for fuel quality. So I, I took on a really capable PhD student and we started working together on developing this probe. And we, we, we found a fluorophore that changed its intensity in response to hydrogen peroxide and we integrated it with that fibre. And I just happened to be chatting, as you do in Adelaide, <laughs> to wineries and people in the wine industry, because we're in the middle of the Barossa, McLaren Vale, Clare Valley, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're having problems with wine, with our wine, you know, we can't tell what's happening in the barrels, da-da-da-da. I'm like, oh, what are you interested in measuring? They said a whole lot of things I didn't understand. I'm like, yeah, yeah, and hydrogen peroxide. Oh, really, hydrogen peroxide. So we started working together and to trying to develop smart bungs for wine barrels, and we now have a project in that area. And then over a glass of wine a few months later with some other people, I said, well, it's nice that we can now start to measure these things in wine. I think that could make a difference in wineries, but it seems pretty silly. And my colleague said, why is it silly? And I, I said, well, we're measuring this hydrogen peroxide in a few nanolitres of wine. Now, even Grange isn't that expensive that it makes a difference to measure in a few nanolitres as opposed to microlitres. Really, it doesn't matter. Our technology is the wrong hammer for this nail. It's fun. We'll get somewhere. We might spin off a technology, but it, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was a problem that we could solve where measuring a few nanolitres mattered? <laughs> and that led through a series of conversations to something that is probably one of the most exciting things we're doing at the moment, which is looking at the beginning of life, looking at embryos at the instant they're fertilised and as they start to develop. Because believe it or not, Hydrogen peroxide, it's a reactive oxygen species and it is a signalling molecule that cells give off in times of stress, at times of great excitement like a sperm entering an oocyte. They talk to the world. They talk to the world through chemical markers like hydrogen peroxide. But at the present time, there were no, well at that time there were no tools for being able to measure that on the scale of a cell. So what we've done is develop a little tiny optical fibre probe and the tip of that optical fibre is the same size as the little the egg, the oocyte, and it sits next to the egg in the incubator that's used for an IVF process. And we can listen to that single embryo as it develops through listening to that signal and there you care about nanolitres because that's the scale you're working on. 
So I tell you this story simply because it tells you that unusual journey from applied problem to fundamental science that is not a story I think you hear a lot in when you're learning about science and I think it makes it fun. Another theme actually that I can draw you to this fibre is um, an applied problem. Again, Defence Science and Technology colleagues said, do you know what happens on aircraft, Tanya, when, what do we do to make sure that they're safe to fly in terms of corrosion? I said, I have absolutely no idea. How many of you guys know what, how, how we keep our plane safe to fly? How you know that the plane you're catching is not going to be a rust bucket? What's that? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> duct tape, duct tape. Oh. <laughs> Between duct, duct tape and WD-40, you've got most of your problems solved. No, um, anyone else? Yeah. Absolutely spot on. Can you believe it? They rip the planes apart every couple of years. Can you, the sheer cost and downtime associated with that, it's just mind-blowing. So the idea we're working to, and this is a 20-year vision, but it's a lot of cool science is coming along the way, is making smart structures that have optical fibres like these, which I'll explain in a sec, embedded within them. And these fibres make the material smart. So essentially by sending light through this fibre, it can tell you if it is rusting. And then, ideally, all you need to do is plug a black box into the end of your plane and, and send bounce green light through it and find out which joint might be corroding within the aircraft. So the way this works, and I show you very, a various range of them here, is that this little centre here is one of these nanorails again. But can you see what distinguishes it from the other nanorails I've shown you so far? Anyone want to tell me what's different? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear any of those. One of the holes is open. That's it. Again, I share this with you because often I think we think, you know, advances in science are so conceptually hard we might not get them. That's all. One of the holes is open. <laughs> but this is profound. Yeah, because can anyone think why having an open hole helps? The light samples the environment. The light can interact with its environment. So you no longer need to stuff your material into the fibre, which can be great if you want to integrate up your signal and use a tiny sample. But if you want to know what's happening outside the fibre, you can do it this way. So then what you can do is you can send a pulse of light into, it, into the fibre. So we're now not talking about continuous light, we're talking about pulses of light. And by using a technique we call optical time domain reflectometry, OTDR, we can look at the time of flight of the return signals. And from the time of flight of the return signals, we can see where the corrosion is happening. So what I'd like to take you on is just two more slides on where we're using these. And then straight after the, um, in the afternoon lecture, I'm going to move then on to some of the nanoparticle work. So here, you can see one of the smart sensors for wine barrels. And you can see some examples where this has been used to, to look at um, spoilage and compare different types of wine. But what you can also see from these images is getting this to work requires you to marry it together with chemistry. And that's a key theme here. This might look like I'm going to do your personal development classes that you had in primary school. I assure you I'm not. Um, but it's a really, really interesting point. Because every time you talk to people that work in other fields, you learn about sometimes how primitive the techniques used are. If a, a woman is having trouble conceiving a baby, there's often very hard to figure out why. Now, biological researchers have discovered that if you take a salty water solution and flush it through the endometrium, and then you take that sample back to the lab, you look at it, the proteins inside, you can figure out in many cases why that woman's not able to conceive. However, flushing the womb with salty water means that woman is unable to conceive that cycle. So what we've been doing is developing one of these probes that I've been talking to you about, but inside a catheter that's designed for embryo transfer for people undergoing IVF processes, that can go in and sample the endometrium at a given spot and measure that protein. And in that case, then, you can say, yes, this endometrium is fertile. You could do an implantation today without having to disrupt its condition. So that's an example of how you can do something disruptive. And while I personally think fertility is a niche 
application. Our problem globally is we have too many people rather than not enough people, although it can affect people personally very intensely. I'm passionate about this going forward to make new tools for diagnosing endometrial cancers, but also endometriosis, which affects roughly 10% of women. And the last example before we quit today is just some pictures to the story I've already told you here, which is these dis distributed sensors for monitoring corrosion. And here's some real data that shows signals bouncing back from along the fibre at different points along the fibre. We've managed to get it to sort of about five metres so far in the latest experiments. We're trying to extend that now out to tens of metres to be truly useful. So I'm going to stop there to give you guys a chance for lunch. Happy to take questions either now or over lunch. Um, and when we come back, I'm going to start to ask a fundamental physics question is what limits the detection that we can do and how can we use nanoparticles to help us. Thank you.